I became a film critic completely by accident. Um, ever since 1964, when I was 12, I would be writing reviews in little diaries, and I'd be keeping these up to date. I'd go and see everything, um, even before I could actually go and see a horror film. Um, I was trying to sneak in and see them. And so I was always writing them down. It was just very intriguing. And then when I moved to London in 1969, um, I got a job in a very, very really trendy hotel, the Portobello Hotel. Literally every single person who was anybody at that time stayed there, um, from ABBA to the Rolling Stones to eventually the Star Wars crew to Richard Dreyfuss, Sp Spielberg, everybody. I was Ryan O'Neill's assistant at one point there. Um, I'm telling you all this to set the space because what happened one night was I was actually writing my reviews um, in my little diary and one of the guests, which was Harlan Ellison, who is a very famous science fiction writer, said, what are you doing? And I said, well, actually, I'm uh, sort of like uh, writing reviews because I've always done it. And oh, let me have a look. And I thought, oh, my God, here's this sort of like incredibly important science fiction writer wanting to see this stuff. And I didn't know if I was ready for it. Anyway, he read it and was so, so, so sweet and constructive and went through, I can't remember the films, actually, but he went through them and said, uh, this, what should do that. And I really, really did get a masterclass from somebody who I really, really did respect. And then, almost concurrently, my best friend Mike Charles, who used to work at Capital Radio, said, I've just been offered a job. Um, Cine Fantastique, a very famous American uh, fantasy magazine, um, their London correspondent had just decided to retire. And he said, uh, why don't we take it over? We did. We used to sort of share a byline together. This was actually going on studio sets, seeing everything. Um, and that sort of like transformed into me writing reviews for the magazine as well. Um, so from that point on, because I was literally one of the very few people writing just horror uh, reviews, I managed to get work from House of Hammer, from Starburst, from all the genre magazines. Um, I'd never worked for Fangoria until later on, though, because I thought that was a different sort of kettle of fish. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to remain British, and I wanted to remain in London. So that's how it all came about. My very first review for Cine Fantastic was for Supersonic Man, which was a sort of a Spanish uh, rip-off of Superman. And I'll always remember, my first line was, is it a bird, is it a plane? No, it's another dud from Spain. And I thought that was really clever. I did learn from that, of course. But Fred Clark, my editor of that, was so brilliant because he let me make my mistakes through the magazine. He was just, he would correct it, let me do it, let me do what I wanted. I learned everything in doing that magazine. And so it sort of like set me in really good stead. I still couldn't go freelance until about 1984, but um, because I started on the magazine in 1976. But by that time, 1985, 86, I was getting enough money from doing everything, set reports, that I decided to go freelance and took it off from there. And may I ask now, do you still, do you make a living from um, film journalism or do you have a day job? I mean, in a way I know the answer to this question, but, um, but It'll be good to hear from you. Mm. Um, I still make a living from film journalism, yes, um, but this has sort of transformed into me being like the, the, the well, the, one of the co-curators of, of Film for Fright Fest. So it's the same sort of thing, really, writing the website. I still do Radio Times, which I love doing. Um, I do website things, for, like for shop till you drop. Um, so yes, I'm still involved. I mean, it doesn't make me half as much money as what it used to. And of course, there's the book side of everything too, which I do. Um, so yeah, I do still make it. I don't, I've never ever gone back since 1985 um, and had a proper job, nor have I ever paid to see a movie. I've, everyone's been really good to me about this. I mean, film criticism is a really strange job. I mean, so many people would say to me, God, what a great job, you know, being paid to see movies. And I say, yeah, okay, fair enough. But you're just thinking about all the good stuff that you're going to see. I have to sit through literally everything all the time. I mean, you know, those national critics, when they have to sit through like 12 movies in three days, I mean, no matter what it is, because it's coming out in the cinema, then, you know, now I don't have to do that. But back then I used to. I used to see every single thing. And of course, it's only so, uh, so much good stuff out there. When you sit through like the 15th bad movie in a row, you, you sort of you know, lose the will to live and think, why am I doing this job? So there is that to, to take. It's not all fantastic hearts and flowers. Um, 
I do find it harder to write a good review than a bad review, I have to say. Bad reviews for me are very easy because you can just really turn on you know, the bitchiness and slag everything off, and I find that a lot easier to do than actually sometimes praiseworthy. And I do think one of the other things about film criticism is you have to keep reinventing what you're saying because otherwise you can so fall into the trap of using the same phrases all the time, like provocative and compelling. You know, you know the, the best film since, insert film here, is this one, you know, and then there's lots of other, there used to be a phrase, remember back in about 10 years ago, it used to be like film on acid, you know, and it would always be that. So you'd have to be very careful. And I've always felt very conscious of making sure that what I do and what I've written about is actually from me. For, for, for a few, for about a year or so, it took me a while to realize that people were actually reading the reviews because of my personality as much as the film. It wasn't me trying to sort of make it you know, available to everybody, you know, oh, what if so-and-so doesn't like it? What if this group doesn't think about it? I just thought, forget it. You've just got to write what you actually think about a film. And if people out there respond to that, then they will keep following you. And that's exactly what's happened through my career. I still get people coming up to me going, I read your review in 1984 of Zone Troopers and it changed my life. So it's very, very good when people do that. How I ever wrote sort of like a thousand words on that film. But you know what I mean? Things change. But I, I do think there is that. It's very hard. But once you get to do it, to put your voice across in a review, I think, and once you've done it, I think that's what shines through above, actually, often, what the film is, is itself. Um, you said that um, you find it easier to write negative reviews mm. than positive reviews, but which do you prefer writing? Oh, I always want to write a good review. I mean, none of us go into a film wanting to hate it, do we? I mean, we don't. Um, we think, you know, but then, you know, within five minutes you can usually tell. So... No, I mean, I'd much rather write a, a good review, and they're the ones that you get on posters and, you know, everything like that, so it's rather nice to see your name on a poster, although they don't do that anymore, they actually just put the magazine. But, I mean, no, that, they're no, but I just think it's, it's nicer sometimes to write a bad review because you can really sort of get your teeth into it in a way you often can't a very good one. What is film criticism for? Well, not much really, is it? I mean, to be honest with you, when I tell people the job I have, it's not like a real job. It, it feels silly. Um, you know, like we're not changing the world or anything. You know, like we're just saying, here's a film. I liked it. Go and see it. Um, as a result of that, you either do or you don't. I don't think we serve that much of fun, especially now when everybody's doing it. Social media can take this over now. But, you know, when I did start this, it was just me and like three other people who were doing it. So, we did seem a bit more important than we are now. I mean, people were actually coming. People were begging me to come to their screenings. These days, you have to beg them to actually get in, you know, to see things. These so it's, it, that has all changed as well. Um, I don't think it's a proper job, but it's one I've really enjoyed doing, and you know, I'm still here doing it. So you know, I feel I must have accomplished something. Um, there are people out there who come up to me and say that they've really enjoyed my writing through the years. So I think that's about the best you can ask for, really. Not to sort of ruin the plot in any ways, but I think the, the basic number one rule, I mean, don't go on too much. I don't, I don't like these people who just think, think they just put down this plot synopsis and say it was good at the end as a film review. It isn't. You really have to, I think, interpret it through the filters that you've already got in place. I mean, you know, my film knowledge goes back well now, well, 60 years now. And as a result of that, I can actually see things in images, um, in techniques, in atmospheres, that perhaps other people can't. And if you bring that into play, then I think that's an important thing. You can actually sort of like ally it to sort of other films of like, I'm not saying, you know, if you liked this film, you'll like that film. It's not a case of that. You can actually find out where the sort of filmmakers are coming from. And it's easy these days to actually recognise what's inspired them and, you know, what indeed has sort of motored that particular film, I think. So there's a lot going on there. I, th I think your film knowledge is really important. I really don't like people who just come into the job you know, from nowhere. Oh, I'm a film critic now. You know, I was I was in sort of accounting last week, and now I'm a film critic. It doesn't work like that. You have to have a broad knowledge, and I think only fans really can do that. I don't think you you can learn anything. People always ask me, you know, well, you know, how is it you've done this? And I I, I still don't know. But it's, as you know yourself, it's something that's sort of like innate from within. I think as long as you put across the basic feelings you had 
um, about a particular film. I'm lucky in the fact that I can review the films I want to review, like the horror movies. So it's a sort of a different, you know, if I, I do do a lot of sort of like normal films, but they're the ones I'm not particularly that keen on. I mean, I can, I, I've got a broader range when it comes to the genre, and I can actually use that to actually inform people more about where it's coming from, where it stays in the present, and what it could possibly mean for the future. When I first started, never had star ratings, of course. You know, you, you read the thing. I think a lot of people nowadays just go, oh, two stars, not reading that. Oh, four stars might read that, might want to go. Um, I understand that it's a marketing tool for the PRs and the film companies. This is what it's all about. We are actually sort of in a thrall to them, in a way. I mean, they're allowing us to see the film. You know, we're making money off writing about it. So we actually have to have some sort of give give I think and take there so fine but I do think it has been abused and I do think just seeing these posters with like five stars five stars four stars is all a bit ridiculous and how easy is it to actually get a five star review these days I mean often you look at a, a five star review and you know that a year later that person who wrote that is going to regret it because it was only very much in the moment. I mean, I, I look back, when you ask me to do this, I look back at a lot of my old reviews, and literally only a very few would I actually sort of think, I got that wrong. Do you know what I mean? I was actually right most of the time. That's not me being arrogant. I actually do think I actually did get it. I got, I got the, the zeitgeist of the time. You know, because all, all those people who said, reviewed Blade Runner and you know and, and then sort of retroactively said it was a masterpiece I can actually prove that most of them didn't I was one of the few people to actually champion that film and so I'm very very happy to have done that so there's that you go back and you can see you know perhaps that look at all the people who reviewed 2001 and saying it was a total you know disaster I love that you know I've got a few things wrong myself I mean I, I've said Howard the Duck was the best film since Star Wars which is obviously completely wrong um, I think that was mainly because I saw the film at, um, at uh, Skywalker Ranch but I mean as a result of that there's that side of it too I mean how much of how much of are you sort of like being you know, tempted to review a film in a certain way. You know, yes, you can see this first. Have this fantastic buffet, you know, that we've put on specially for you. You know, yes, you know, you have got this, you know, special sort of like relationship with us over this film. Oh, and what do you think of the film? You know, and then of course, what are you going to say? Unless you're really honest, which I always am, they're going to say, oh, I thought it was quite good, which is not the case often. The very first film I saw at a press show was The Three Musketeers, the Dick Lester. And I walked through the door and it was amazing. I mean, you're in this like tiny preview theater in Mordor Street, because that really was the hub of all the preview theaters back then. And it was great to see everybody there. That scene came crashing down the very next pressure I saw when literally it was just me. And then I suddenly realized that it was only the real popular films that people would actually go to. Otherwise, the PRs of various film companies would be begging you to go. I would be called up and say, would you come and see I Escape from Devil's Island tonight? And you'd go and you'd be the only one there. And literally the PR would be serving you with like a pizza to make sure that you saw the film and you were happy. Because they couldn't believe, A, that you wanted to see the film, and B, that, you know, that they had to put a press show on for it. So you've got that side of it. So that's completely different. And as that went through, and of course, we're dealing with... Most films now are day and dated, aren't they? I mean, they open all over the world at exactly the same time. Then they didn't. You often had a six-month gap between Star Wars, between E.T., between every major film. You'd heard about the film in America, then you had to wait here six months to see it. And if you were lucky, like I used to be, I mean, you'd get to the very first press show, which was always like six months in advance. We never had any embargo. We were told, oh, you won't review this, will you? No, 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 of course not. So no embargo was ever in place. They just took it as like a gentleman's agreement that you wouldn't say anything about the film until six months later. But they did it so you could see it at the time it was becoming a big popular success. That's all completely changed because everything is a global phenomenon. You literally, they micromanage it now to within a minute of it opening everywhere in the world. It's very rare to do that. So that's really changed a lot. Um, also, the whole preview system's changed. I mean, you know, it used to be you'd get um, the radio and television screening, which would be four months in advance. Then it would be the magazine screening, which would be three months in advance. I've got that around the wrong way. 
the way it's been handled has changed. When it's actually, you know, you'd get a, a long lead magazine, which would be four months in advance. You'd get the usual magazine, which would be three months in advance. And you get radio and TV, which would be a month in advance. And then you get the national press shows within the week of release. Now, that's all gone completely all over the place, because very rarely now do any of us see any of the major films you know, within, you know, after about two weeks before they're due to come in, isn't it? That's usually the window now. If you're lucky and you're at a junket and you can see it, um, two weeks, I think, is the earliest sometimes you can actually see films. That's completely changed in the way I do. It, it's really weird because I would always write my reviews when I saw the films back then in case I forgot them, otherwise I'd have to go and see them again. Um, sometimes you would go and see them again. But back then when, you know, because I actually, my, my career started at the very beginning of the blockbuster era. I mean, when you think about it, because, you know, Jaws was the first film to actually reinvent the whole summer blockbuster saga. And that was when I actually entered the industry. So therefore, I actually sort of saw this actually happen. Whereas before, no one cared when a film opened. It was usually three months after the American anyway. But then it all changed. Look, I mean, you know, it being initially suspicious about, you know, the internet and blogging and all that sort of stuff that, to begin with, and thinking, oh my God, they're all doing it for free. This is the end of our paid work as we know it. It has sort of gone through a bit of a hoop there, hasn't it? So we are actually making money. And there is a way to monetize what you do on the internet, I think. Um, I've been able to do that. If other people have, great. Um, if you're doing something for free, then you're crazy. I just don't know. No fee, no me is my, my mantra, and I've always stuck by that. Um, when it comes to you know, how much you make, um, I think you have to do quite a, a lot of it. And I think that's actually where we find a problem because you can actually sort of like spread yourself too thin and it becomes all the same. I mean, you go online, go on IMDb, and look how many sort of people have, re have reviewed one film. It's like, you know, like, it seems like 50,000. And you, you sort of go to the website, don't you? And it says, no longer exists. So, you know, half these people only do it for like six months, realise there's no money in it, and then sort of get out of it. But I mean... I think there's, it's been important in getting new writers up front, and there have been some good ones. And I do, but I still think, like everything else, it's uh, sort of like you know the cream rises to the top, everyone else sinks away. But that's the way it used to be when you know you'd sort of send reviews to Time Out or City Limits back in the day, and if the editor liked it, he'd join it. If you didn't, you were out. You know, so that still hasn't changed. It's just this, I think, is a bit more a ruthless way of doing it. Is print going to survive? I'd like to think so. Um, in a way, I don't care, because I'm reaching to the end of it all anyway, and, you know, what happens, happens. I won't be reliant on a, a job in, any, in either print or online, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so, it, it has to, doesn't it? I mean, so it's, it, it's going to... I'm, if people are out there... As long as films exist, people want, or want... As long as films exist, people want to know what other people think of them. Other people they respect will think of them. So I think it will continue. Um, but where people used to get a sort of a following, I think they don't so much anymore. I think it's very ephemeral. I think you can read something for like, you know, like Joe Blow or Arrow in the Head for like two weeks and then you'll move on to Shock Till You Drop to whatever the next, uh, you know, new website is that you think might be quite interesting. So I, don't th I think that's what's changed is that sort of um, loyalty factor. I would like to think that if you're being paid for your work as a film critic, you do have a bit more, you know, cachet than somebody who isn't being paid for it and you've never heard of. I mean, I will always read... Um, actually, who will I always read, thinking about it? Well, Mark Kermode. I'll always read his stuff, of course, but that's more the fact that he's a friend than anything else. I just want to see where he's got it wrong. Do you know what I mean? But no, there's that. So, yes, I mean... But I'm not interested in social media tweets about certain films because you know they've been bought and paid for. I'm not interested in sort of user comments on IMDb because usually they're not and usually it's some, you know, a friend of the director or they're so badly written or they're from Colombia and they've just seen some sort of dodgy, you know, DVD copy or ripped it from somewhere. So you don't take any notice of those. So, I, you know, I do think you have to be more... Um, you know, picky about where you go for this stuff now. I think, but I think it does shine through. I think people will do that. I think people soon know. You know, surely it can't all be going the same way where it's just like 
one superhero review after another, almost saying the same stuff. It can't go that way. So I think there is a sort of like a, a future for this, as long as, as I said, as long as film exists, and as long as it keeps making the money, it does. I mean, you can go to VOD, you can go to DVD, you can go to any platform you like, but if, as long as there's still content to be reviewed, I think people will be interested in reading your comments on it. Gate, gate criticism was me and Vito Russo. Is, is it? I mean, I, I met Vito. Um, I really loved it. I thought that documentary was great on him. Um, um, he was in a different area than me. He actually was very politically orientated. I wasn't, so it didn't make any difference to me. I did get, very early on, I did get a few people saying, oh, you've only reviewed this film because you fancy the leading man, which is so ridiculous, because I could say that to any straight critic. You know, you only reviewed this because you fancy Megan Fox. You know, whatever. This is so ridiculous. Um, the only time... I really did feel that it made an actual difference in a negative way was, I'm not going to mention the film, but um, it was written by, this is going back 20 years, but it was written by a, a gay writer. Um, uh, his actress uh, sister was actually the star of the movie. Um, I hated it. I thought it was awful. It was everything I hated about a gay movie. You know, terrible agenda, stupid, really patronising. And I said all this. It was a fantasy movie as well, and I said all this. Um, the very next day, when it hit the publication, um, I got phoned up by that writer and said, how dare you write what you did? You're a gay man. You should have been a bit more sympathetic. And I said, look, that makes no difference. The film was terrible. You did a bad job. It did make a... Once I sort of phoned the, the PR company back and said, how the hell did this guy get my, you know, personal phone number anyway? But I stuck to my guns and I said, and that's the only time where I've ever had anybody really sort of like try and take me down. And the film vanished without a trace, needless to say. And as a result, of that's the only time I've ever had anything of a sort of like a possible professional impact on me. I was always upfront about that anyway. I've never hidden the fact that I'm no, gay no, in no. any way whatsoever from anybody. I never gave a shit about it. Who, who cares? But so, but you know, but sometimes people have come up to me and no, they haven't. That's not true. You know, that was the only time that it ever really made a difference. I'm sure Ebony magazine has a sort of a black film critic. They have to, don't they? I mean, I'm sure that's what it is. I mean, you know, there is a sort of like a broad church when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, now, there are a lot of gay critics. But back then, it, as I said, it was me and Vito Russo. Oh, actually, that's not true. There were a couple, but they were in the closet. I won't, I won't out them. You know who I mean. I, I, I've never had any of the problems that a lot of, you know, the film, you know, the London Critics Circle. Some of the problems people have there, you think, really? Well, that's never happened to me. Um, and it hasn't happened to me. I've been pretty good. I mean, if I've needed to see a film in the last sort of like 10 years, I call up the PR and go, can I see the film? Yeah, come to the next screening. I've never, ever, ever had any problems. Nothing has stopped me making money. If, uh, if I need to see something, I will do it. Um, back in the day, I would often travel um, to, to Amsterdam. In the Video Nasties era, I would actually go to Amsterdam and France and see films there, come back and review them. I'm going to brag a bit here, just this one time. Um, but one of, the, one, one of the most really exciting things that happened to me was when um, I met Quentin Tarantino for the first time, and he actually quoted to me literally the very first paragraph of my review from Dress to Kill from Starburst, and I was gobsmacked, and I couldn't believe it, and I said, I don't believe it. He said, I read all your stuff, and this is the one passage that really stuck in my mind. And I thought, if I got through to him, then that's great. And to be honest with you, that was one of the best, one of the best nights of my life, actually, because I, he, was, he was just talking, talking, talking about the same films, and I thought, well, wow, you know, that's how you can impact. People like, um, you know, Dillis Powell, I mean, she sort of, like, impacted me. Joe Dante, when he was a writer in Castle of Frankenstein, he made an enormous difference to the way I saw film. I mean, he, was re he would review every sort of Italian exploitation film from the 60s, and I was just couldn't wait to see them as a result of it. I was so happy to be able to tell him how important he was uh, to my form formation as a film critic. And there's that, I think... It's great that, you know, we're sort of like people can do that. Well, Radio Time is interesting for me and I love the discipline it gives me because I do have to write for a very, very wide audience. As a result of that, I have to knock a lot of sort of like the fanboyish things on the head. Whereas when it comes to sort of like uh, 
any other genre magazine, you know, the hard geek in me does come out and as a result of that. But other people can recognise that and know that you're not fooling and what you're saying is from the heart. And I think that's really quite important because, you know, if you're a hard geek, you will recognise certain things in, in various phrases and you'll know, you know, what you're trying to say. I try and do it in my programme notes for Fright Fest, actually, um, you know, because I think, you know, if you pick up on this, you'll actually get exactly what, whereas the Westminster City Council, when they read it, won't know what, I, what the hell I'm talking about and let it pass. So you know what I mean? So there's that side of it. I like that sort of cleverness of being able to... Uh, and there's, there's also that too, isn't there? I mean, I, when, when you're writing about film, it's very hard sometimes to think of the really sort of great turn of phrase. And when you've actually got it, you think, that's the one, you know, that's the one. Often the, the, the thing for me, which I find sometimes so difficult, is getting the very first line. Once I've got the first line, it flows pretty quickly, I find. And I also like just doing now synopsis um, in like one lines too and that's actually another discipline that's quite hard to do um, but you know back in again back in the 70s I could write forever you know I was turning in 2,000 word reviews of like Dario Argento movies now I have to I have to remain at either 150 words or 100 words and that actually in itself is quite a tricky you know thing to pull off it's all the same thing I think you just sort of like transfer it over into a different you know idiom really um, all the books I've done um, have just been I've just used what I've learned from the film criticism side of it and my journalism side and I've just applied it really I, I, I've always with my books I deal with hard facts I'm, I'm not one of these people who actually sort of like tends to sort of over flour over egg stuff I actually like just dealing with the facts as I've learnt them and I think that's quite a an, 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 for me that's what what I want to read about I don't want to read other people's personal opinions when it comes to books funnily enough but I mean so I just want to know the facts so I can make up my own mind there so it's it's slightly different I, I find that completely different from the film criticism where it's me putting across what I feel and you're either going to like it or not so what film criticism isn't to me is um, just putting a plot synopsis and saying it was good, it was bad, what stars are in it, which does pass as like a, what a lot of people do these days. I think you have to be a bit more clever about it than that. I think you've actually got to put in perspective where it comes from, possibly mention the director, his past work. You know, you can filter the themes through, where does it come from in the scheme of things, you know. And there's, there's lots of different things. I think you, when you first go into this job, you don't realise. I think over a, over a while you realise what you do have to put in and what you don't. I mean, for a while, um, for about six months, it, it took me ages to realise that it was about me in relation to the film. It wasn't me trying to be, like everybody's best friend when I came to writing these things you know if people didn't like what I wrote fair enough you know too bad but if they did then great so it was a personal your own personal opinion has to shine through I think above everything else and I think that's what people respond to and that's why a lot of people have grown up with my work because they liked it and they thought oh I like what he said uh, I'll, I'll be reading him in future and they they stuck with me so as even to this day you know with Fright Festers coming up to me going you know oh I read your reviews back in 1976 and you're going oh yes you know well great so you know if it made a difference then that's fantastic let's talk about poster quotes actually because that's really changed um, before um, they would just, they'd just be able to take anything out, put your name on it, and they would never ask for your, um, you know, agreement. Um, do you mind this? Um, they'd never ask you. They'd just do it. And I had a really good example, whereas there, there was a film um, called Slipstream, which uh, starred Mark Hamill. It was a Gary Kurtz science fiction film. It was completely dreadful. But my very first line was, Mark Hamill is fantastic in Slipstream, but the rest of the film is complete garbage. Of course, the film company, Mark Hamill is fantastic. Now, I really complained about this because it gave me a really, really... It made it look like I'd actually liked the movie. That's changed. People now have to come to you and get your approval to use quotes, but that never used to be the case. And so sometimes it's nice actually seeing it there. You know, I've got... I've kept everything with my name, you know, Alan Jones magazine underneath, but now when it's just like the name of the magazine is all they care about, or like four or five stars, I haven't kept those. But, I mean, it's nice to go back and see what actual posters you were on. They're really funny. So there is that that's changed a lot. People didn't care before about film reviews. And they tell you they don't care about them now. But in a way, they, they are helpful. Oh, there was a big test case in, in America where somebody 
took um, one of the film companies to court. God, I wish I could remember what the film was. Ah, oh, I do remember it really well, but I can't remember what the film was. And, and whoever it was won the court case. And as a result of that, it all had to change. And was that because of misrepresentation? Yes, you? Right. exactly, yeah. exactly that. Of course, nowadays, what do we get? You know, you get, we see the film. The very next morning, you get a, an email from the uh, press office. Um, could we have your thoughts, please? So it's only for internal use only. Mm -hmm. So you say, it was good, you know, I really enjoyed it, blah, 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 blah. Back five minutes later, oh, we really like this phrase. Could we use it? No, because it's just my original thoughts, and that might not be necessarily in my review. So people who actually just sort of give them complete approval to use whatever they've done like that, I think they really are, quote, whores. And I know I've been called one myself, but it isn't the case, because I can honestly say that everything I've, every poster I've been on, I've actually, you know, I can stand by and say, yes, I'm, I'm happy with that. Whereas I wonder how many people actually can. And of course, these days, it doesn't even matter. I mean, how many Twitter handles are you seeing on from people who, nothing. Fabulous. Then you look at it, you know, Stuart from Grimsby, you know, you know, so... You know, it doesn't make any difference. People just read the first thing they see, don't they? So it doesn't make any difference. They used to do that back in the 60s with sex films. You know, they used to do that all the time. Get people's names the same as the film critics and put them on. You know, so if you were if you were named Alexander Walker and you lived in, you know, Scotland, you'd find yourself there sometimes just so you could be mistaken as the Alexander Walker who might have written for The Standard. So it was a very common practice back then. And having your name forever associated with a porn yeah, <laughs> that's your claim. Can you imagine? I mean, it's <laughs> such a laugh. Yeah, like, you know, but, 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 that, but that was, um, um, what's his name? David, was, David Merrick on Broadway, he did that. On one of his shows, got terrible reviews. He actually got people who actually had the same names as the film, all the main film critics in New York, and said, come and see my show for free. Then they all got to see it. And they said, oh, it's great. And then that's what they put on the thing. And for years, that caused for... So it was, it was very, very bad practice like that that actually had to change because it's just such an... But it can be so abused, can't it? Rotten Tomatoes never read. I think it's a pointless waste of time. Never bother. I mean, never look at it. You know, it's, honestly, I can honestly say that. Never, I just don't care. It's like IMDb in general. I mean, you know, sometimes you go to it just to look. But mistakes, you know, terrible typos, n not very accurate... Don't trust it. Well, every year you go through a bit of a think, oh my God, this film's worse than last week's film, you know, so how many more of these are there going to be? You know, but in general, no, I don't think you... You have to keep optimistic about this, don't you? It has to be your job. You've got to, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm really lucky in the fact that it's what I love and I'm doing it as a profession. You know, my obsession is my profession. I always used to say that. But, I, but you know, so it's great that I'm doing it, but... The moment I thought, oh my God, I've had enough of this, I'm going to give up, then it would be, I would give up. Because, I mean, I just don't think you can do that. If you really are tired of it, you shouldn't be doing the job. You know, various people on Fleet Street, you know, should really, you know, take note of that. They should have been retired years ago. Luckily, a couple of them have been recently. But, I mean, you know, the fact they've been going on for years, and you could tell that they, their heart wasn't in it anymore. You can tell the enthusiasm. I think even in a bad review, if you're enthusiastic about it, that shines through, and it doesn't matter. I, one of the things that's always struck me about what I do, especially with the genre films, why, why I could often get away with slagging films off so much is because um, horror fans, in a way, will go and see everything. I can say a film is as bad, bad as it could be till I'm blue in the face. But if you're a genre enthusiast, you want to go and see it for yourself, you want to tick that box, and you want to say, look, okay, Insidious 10 wasn't particularly that great, but I've seen it and I have my own opinion. Only on the horror genre does that happen. Not on no other genre does it. It's very liberating because it means that actually you can ignore evaluation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I mean, a lot of a lot of film, a lot of PS. Back again. I mean, most people don't know this. And I was at, I've been when I I've, when I've mentioned this story, the critic circle. There were looks of horror, but in the seventies, all the PRs of every film company would get together on like I think a three monthly basis and discuss all the film critics. They would actually say, well, what do you think about him? How's he? Is he, is he doing okay? What do you wear? Yeah, nice, nice. Should we drop him? Should we actually put him on this list? I was astonished when I learned that. 
and I'm because one of my best friends at the time, Rosemary Goodfriend, she used to work for UIP back in. She was like one of the doyens of Wardour Street. You know, if you cross Rosemary, you are out of the industry completely. If you stayed on a good side, you were fine. Um, but she told me that you know, oh yeah, it was pretty ruthless. You know, if you didn't cut the mustard and they didn't like what you were doing, you would find yourself not on that press list. And before, and as we all know. We all have to be on the press list to get the invites to come through. Whereas I think now that happens on a film by film basis. Yes, it does. Um, I mean, I think it's probably much more. There's probably an algorithm making the decision. Yes. Than a well, I mean, you know, they, you know, when we had that meeting, did, were you there at that meeting with the Critics Circle with everyone? They were very honest about how films are now targeted. You know, I saw Insidious Three with an audience of um, social media bloggers who all had a million hits each. That was what was the most important. There was not one other film critic there that I recognised. All these people were on YouTube doing silly six-minute videos. But as long as they said, Insidious, it's out, it's fabulous, that's why they were there. So it's all targeted now. Or champions is the word they like now. They get you together, don't they? And they say, well, if you like this film, you know, go out and tell everybody. And of course, they know exactly what films you're going to like. And so... That's another clever way of doing it. I mean, you know, but we can manipulate them as much as they can manipulate us. So, you know, and then, of course, what's really important, I mean, film criticism doesn't actually affect the, the big blockbusters, the Jurassic World, the Terminator genesis of the... Everyone's going to go and see those anyway. But film criticism is really important for those small independent foreign films that people might not necessarily know anything about. And yet if people say, this is fantastic, go and see it, a lot of people will just based on the fact that they think, oh, if this person likes this film in black and white in sub Swedish subtitles, then perhaps I should go and see it too. So when they want you, the PR companies, they want you. When they don't, they don't give a shit. Yeah, and there's definitely, I mean, there's one or two, which I'm not going to name, which are, you know, if you, if you deliver your very negative review of one of their films, you're off their list. Or E1 or entertainment. Pardon? Both. <laughs> E1 or entertainment. <laughs> Well, entertainment. It happened to me, but I know people it's happened to. So oh, I no, no, no. I know exactly how many people. I've never been on any sort of body's shit list, though. I've never been dropped from anywhere because of that. Again, it's because of my the genre it's stuff. I'm, well, I'm well, almost. I stat, you say that, please. I mean, you know, just because I've. I mean, the fact that you've done it for forty years. I just wonder if that actually means anything. Because in the scheme of things, it doesn't really. I can just look back and think, I've made a lot of money out of this game, out of the film industry, and that's fine. I don't care if people like me or hate me, not interested. I made the money, that's fine. Well, I'll I tell you another example. I mean, um, my be one of my best friends is a, a, a director called Buddy Giovanazzo, and we would have only have met um, because I reviewed his film Combat Shock in Shock Express. I gave it a rave review. He wrote to me um, through the magazine and said, this is the best review I've ever read of any, anything. You got it exactly. I love you. If you're in New York, come and see me. I was in New York very, very soon after. Um, saw him and we found out we were born on exactly the same day as well. And we've remained the closest of friends ever since. I stay with him when I go to the Berlin Film Festival. So it's all good. So there's another good. On the negative side of it, no. I've had people come up to me and go, Nobody reads your stuff. Who cares about what you think about my movie? And of course, they've disappeared without a trace. So there's been that side of it. But no, not really. I'm very honest with people, even Ben Wheatley, because I slagged off Field in England like you wouldn't believe, hated it. Um, and he, he was, you know, he said, oh, well, there you go. I will tell people to their face what, what because I, I'm not one of these darling, you were wonderful people. I can't. You go and see a film, and if you don't like it, you've got to tell them. There's a good example at the moment. Um, of uh, one of my best friends who's just made a film and it's not very good and I've, I told him that it wasn't very good and yet he knew it wasn't too they know this is the thing they, I, I can't be dishonest about stuff people know if I'm lying so if people ask me the truth about stuff especially when it comes to submissions for Fright Fest I'll tell you I watch them they go well what did you think and I will tell them absolutely and if they don't like it then they shouldn't have asked me for my opinion but I will never ever ever lie about that because I don't think if they're going to read it say possibly six months down the line what are you going to say darling it was wonderful and then suddenly they, they read it later on that you didn't like it there, there are a lot of phrases you can use I did a, an article on this once where I came up with all the phrases that you could actually 
um, slag something off without actually meaning it. You know, like you could say, well, I've never seen anything quite like it, was one. Or there was another one like, well, it's awfully good. You know, it was like, and you know, and then there's the other one where you go, you know, darling, you know, what can I say? There's, there's no words. You know? So you could actually really shroud it quite well, I think. Um, you know, and what was Pedro Almodovar's one that he told me he loved? Oh, it was like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody came up to him after one of the films they did and said, um, it's so fresh, it's so different, I'm not sure I'm quite ready for it. So there's, there's so many ways you could actually get rid of that. I think it's great, but I will always tell people the truth. If I love it, that's the way they know you're being honest. 